However, we do this uh, using um, uh, using um, in vitro model of human digestion. Uh, so we have tested the bioaccessibility of those compounds after gastric and intestinal phase of uh, uh, in vitro digestion. Uh, you can see here that vitamin C um, bioaccessibility was better after treatment uh, of plants with uh, Thamus communis or Polygrioni, as I have shown you earlier. And you can see that this um, improved concentration of vitamin C in microbeans was predicted after gastric and intestinal phase of digestion. So the, the, uh, the, significant, uh, the difference in concentration was significant on the level P0.05. Uh, uh, then we checked the bioaccessibility of quercetin. Again, uh, it was better in microgreens um, treated with hypericum perforatum extract, and this uh, uh, bioaccessibility was uh, uh, maintained after gastric um, uh, digestion. However, after intestinal uh, digestion uh, phase, uh, the difference was um, uh, neutralized. So it is it is uh, completely same uh, whether you will take uh, not treated, uh, not improved microgreens or those improved by hypericum perforatum uh, on the level of quercetin because uh, the difference after uh, intestinal phase of digestion will be neutralized. And finally, we checked the uh, bioaccessibility of apigenin as well. It was by far are better uh, in initial and after gastric phase of digestion in uh, microbes enriched with uh, chamomile uh, extract. However, after intestinal phase of digestion, we could not uh, record um, apigenin nor in control, neither in um, uh, uh, tested the group of microgreens. Obviously, apigenin is uh, completely unstable uh, in uh, uh, our intestinal uh, digestion uh, conditions. Then we also, we also checked whether uh, this improvement of plants uh, will be um, um, will be um, uh, possible to be detected in the uh, extracts of those improved microgreens. So we we have prepared the extracts of uh, improved microgreens uh, and control as well, uh, and tested their ability to inhibit uh, enzyme. We have chosen our family enzyme. Enzyme it's an enzyme. Uh, connected with um, uh, diabetes type 2, and we wanted to see whether these uh, any any uh, group of uh, microgreens that has been improved by interspecific transfer of metabolites will be able to uh, better inhibit this uh, uh, enzyme. And indeed, the um, uh, microgreens uh, uh, of Chinese cabbage improved by uh, extract of Thamus communis or black brioni was significantly better in the inhibition of this enzyme compared to the control uh, or some other tested uh, uh, groups. So uh, this uh, interspecific transfer of metabolites, not just that in, in improves the phytochemical profile of plant uh, acceptor, uh, it, uh, this improvement is quite stable uh, even uh, under the conditions of our uh, intest uh, gastrointestinal uh, digestion system, and it is even um, uh, uh, persistent uh, and uh, detectable uh, regarding the uh, efficiency of the extracts of such plants against uh, certain enzymes. We also checked the effect of those um, uh, extracts of those microgreens uh, on the proliferation of uh, cancer cells. We have chosen MCF7 cell culture as an example for uh, cancer cells. And as an example of healthy cells, we use um, cake cells or human embryonic kidney cells. Different concentrations have been tested. And 100 milligram per kilogram of fresh weight has been shown very interesting because uh, microgreens uh, uh, of Chinese cabbage uh, um, improved by hypericum rose and chamomile uh, extracts, they were significantly better in the inhibition of proliferation of these cancer cell uh, cells. Uh, and in the same time, uh, the same concentration did not affect the uh, proliferation of healthy uh, cells or human embryonic kidney cells. Again, a potential of this strategy uh, on this level as well. Uh, we also uh, checked whether this strategy uh, can even affect the expression of genes in the plant uh, acceptor. So we have tested using RTQ-PCR uh, the expression of genes in uh, phenylpropanoid biosynthetic pathway. We have tested the expression uh, of calcon synthase and flavonol synthase, so main enzyme in the synthesis of uh, phytochemicals that we have been interested in. Uh, we have uh, um, incubated the microbes uh, for two different um, 
time period because we didn't know whether four hours incubation will be uh, enough for um, uh, uh, for uh, effect uh, for being able to see any effect on gene expression. However, it was uh, quite enough. So we have four hours and five days uh, incubation time. We have tested two uh, groups, those treated with hypericum and rose, and you can see that. Uh, um, uh, both of the genes, flavonolsyntase and halconsyntase, uh, after the incubation uh, with the uh, hypericum perforatum uh, water extract, the expression of these genes was reduced. Uh, specifically, uh, uh, significantly more it was reduced halconsyntase, probably because this is the first enzyme in a phenylpropanoid biosynthetic pathway, and the flavonolsyntase is downward, so if um, if you uh, downregulate the first enzyme, then uh, already uh, that will uh, affect the uh, down regula uh, regulation of uh, enzymes downwards in the biosynthetic pathway. So uh, um, a more strong or more significant inhibition of first enzyme was expected, and these results showed that as well. Uh, after the incubation with rose extract, we can see also um, down regulation of halconsyntase. However, uh, uh, after only four hours of incubation, uh, a slight um, upregulation of flavonolsyntase and five days later incubation down regulation. So we can see that this strategy even uh, affects the expression of genes in uh, flavon uh, in um, uh, plant uh, acceptors. So this strategy is really uh, sh uh, showing its potential for um, uh, human nutrition for uh, Phytochemical profile of plants, therefore human nutrition, and for further biological uh, ex uh, experiments and investigations. So uh, uh I hope these results have now uh, convinced you that interspecies natural metabolites is really a potential strategy to improve uh, plant food. And uh, uh, now what we further made a step further uh, is that we have tested whether uh, these interspecies transfer of metabolites might be um, improved by use of membrane permeabilizers. So membrane permeabilizers, they will change the um, in some way properties of the membrane. Uh, we have used the two uh, most common uh, membrane permeabilizers, those are uh, EDTA and TWIN. Uh, and here in this uh, experimental setup, we have just turned uh, the experiment around. We have used one plant donor and three different plant acceptors. Again, microgreens of broccoli, cauliflower, and kale. As a uh, plant donor, we used Camellia sinensis water extract, uh, uh, a side of, of coffee that we have uh, heard uh, today something about uh, uh, tea or water except of Camellia sinensis is uh, uh, the most common um, uh, beverage in the world and it's a great source of catechins, flavanols, uh, very strong antioxidants. So we want to see whether these will be uh, able, to, will be possible to uh, transfer into these microgreens because microgreens of um, uh, brassicaceous vegetables, they, they uh, have very low or under detection level uh, of uh, so here are some of the results. Uh, we have um, a control group of microgreens uh, of broccoli, cauliflower, and kale, and those treated with pure uh, tea or tea in combination with, with membrane permeabilizers, EDTA or twin. We have tested the concentration of total phenolics, total catechins, and, and soluble sugars I want to share with you as well. So here you can see that for if you want to uh, enrich the microgreens with total phenolics, it is advisable to use um, uh, T in combination with EDTA. So EDTA as a membrane permeabilizer obviously help the trans uh, the transfer and the uh, um, increase of concentration of total phenolics in microgreens of broccoli, of cauliflower specifically, uh, even in kale uh, as well. Uh, total catechins, they have been also increased. You can see that in the case of uh, broccoli, uh, both uh, EDTA and twin have helped in a similar um uh, level the uh, increase uh, of these uh, uh, catechins. Uh, same thing with the cow uh, uh, with the cauliflower um, uh, microgreens, and then in kale, um, um, uh, use of membrane permeabilizers has not significantly improved the, the transport of catechins. Uh, even more, the best uh, result was with the pure tea. Then we also check the concentration of soluble sugars. Sugars, why sugars uh, uh, are uh, very important. Um, 
uh, uh, phytochemicals uh, um, for people suffering from diabetes. Uh, they always tend to take in the food uh, with uh, as low amount of sugars as possible. And we check the concentration of sugars as well. And you can see that after treatment uh, or um, uh, after application of interspecies transfer of metabolites uh, between tea and uh, broccoli, uh, uh, broccoli microgreens, uh, uh, you will get the microgreens with the lower concentration of sugars. And this is really uh, interesting. Um, specific, uh, specifically, if you uh, apply uh, tea in combination with twin as a permeabilizer, then the best result uh, with the microgreens of cauliflower we um, gained with the application of tea in combination with EDTA. And finally, uh, kale was the best if it was uh, um, um, uh, it was it, it, if, if it was treated with tea in combination with twin. So definitely, uh, use of per membrane permeabilizers is plausible. It shows uh, results. It shows potential uh, in this strategy as well. Then we check the concentration of vitamin C, caffeine, uh, quercetin. Vitamin C again, use of uh, EDTA as a membrane permeabilizer uh, is advisable because it will significantly improve the concentration of vitamin C uh, in the microgreens of broccoli. Uh, then the same thing, EDTA is quite good to be used uh, with the kale microgreens. And caffeine was interesting, so it was not uh, detectable in microgreens of br uh, broccoli, cauliflower, and kale um, uh, uh, before uh, interspecies transfer of metabolites. However, after uh, this uh, um, strategy was applied, we actually got the microgreens of, of uh, veg uh, microgreens of brassicaceous vegetables enriched with caffeine. And in case of broccoli and cauliflower, that was much, much better uh, uh, in combination with membrane permeabilizers. Quercetin, a strong antioxidant as well. If you use it with, uh, if you use the uh, tea with uh, EDTA, you will get the best the results in um, microgreens uh, of uh, broccoli, uh, uh, while in uh, cauliflower and kale, uh, those um, results were quite similar between tested and control group. We also checked uh, whether these uh, results will be uh, visible uh, uh, in the bioactivity of the extracts of those microgreens. Again, we tested the activity of those uh, uh, microgreens uh, test, uh, treated with or with uh, without or with uh, membrane permeabilizers on the inhibition of alpha amylase and glucosidase enzymes uh, that are uh, connected with diabetes type 2 and lipase enzyme uh, connected with uh, obesity. And we can see that the use of um, Membrane permeabilizers really can uh, help to uh, uh, can uh, help to uh, inhibit the alpha amylase better. Specifically, here in the case of kale uh, microgreens, uh, if we use uh, tea in combination with EDTA or, or twin, the uh, percentage of inhibition of this enzyme will be uh, significantly better. Uh, same thing for uh, glucosidase. The better the best results will uh, be uh, seen for uh, cauliflower. Uh, microgreens if you use uh, tea with uh, EDTA. Uh, and then we also check the lipase. Uh, it can be seen that uh, improvement will be seen uh, after treatment with tea or tea with EDTA. Here in the case of uh, broccoli microgreens and kale microgreens, the best results uh, we gained after the treatment with tea in combination with twin. So if we put all these results uh, on one slide, uh, uh, we uh, have made here uh, circles for each of the uh, microgreens type. Uh, um, a blue uh, pizza cut of the uh, circle represents uh, the share of uh, uh, resistant or not change the variables after this interspecies transfer of metabolites, while the red part uh, presents the change uh, or susceptible parameters. And you can see that after treatment with mem uh, with membrane permeabilizer EDTA, the share of the change parameters will be the highest. So the use of this EDTA is really uh, plausible and shows a potential for further investigation. We also um, 
uh, separated these change the parameters into those that were uh, that were decreased and those increased and you can see that the majority of those uh, changes were actually in a positive way so they were uh, increased or uh, improved by use of uh, membrane pain analyzer uh, all these results we have published in these two papers 2020 2023 uh, so you can find more information in those papers uh, hopefully uh, new uh, data will be able for publication uh, soon and if you have any questions please just let me know these are all the collaborations or all the collaborators i have to thank uh, spe spe specifically maria from institute Roger boskovic in croatia in zagreb and the group from uh, germany uh, that has done the qr to pcr analysis and thank you for your attention Thank you, Dr. Ivana. You're welcome. Yes, yes. Uh, is there any questions to ask? So thank you very much once again for your valuable presentation. OK, thank you. Yes, you'll be getting the participation certificate within two to three days. Thank you. Bye. OK, OK. So now I request uh, Dr. Ilaria Hanosi to see our university, Vitabo from Italy. Good morning. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK. I am sharing uh, my screen. Yes. OK. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to join your conference and to present my research regarding the recovery of natural pigments by enzyme-assisted extraction. Firstly, I would like to talk to you about food waste. Globally, it has been estimated that about one third of all the food produced for human consumption is lost each year. And in the European Union, about 50% of all the fruits and vegetables go to waste throughout the entire food chain. However, today we know that food waste is a cheap source of high added value compounds, such as natural pigments, which may be recovered and reused inside the food chain. So, in the context of a circular economy model, our research has been focused on unsold tomato and unsold red beet deriving from processing distribution and marketing as source of natural pigments. Tomato is rich in carotenoids, a fat soluble group of pigments characterized by a yellow orange red nuance, which are extensively applied in the production of ice cream, cheddar cheese, but also in beverages. Whereas red beets are rich in betalines, a water soluble group of pigments deriving from betalamic acid, which include red purple betachanins and yellow orange betaxanthins. Betalines are widely applied in dairy production, but also in confectionery and in the production of beverages. Now, uh, carotenoids in tomato cell are protected by two different biological structures. The cell wall, mainly composed of polysaccharides such as cellulose, pectin, and hemicellulose, and chromoplasts, which are special organelles able to synthesize and store large amounts of carotenoids. Their membrane is, ma is mainly composed of lipids and proteins in a ratio of about one to one. Whereas beta aligns in red beet are stored inside the vacuole, whose membrane is composed of phospholipids and glycoproteins. Uh, they the conventional technique commonly applied for the recovery of natural pigments from vegetable food waste is solvent extraction, which is based on the use of an organic solvent. 
despite this procedure is simple, inexpensive and easy to use, it has a relevant impact on the environment since it requires a large amount of solvent and a long extraction time. Uh, in addition, solvent extraction is neither selective nor conservative, often resulting in pigment degradation. So for all these reasons, different green and conventional extraction methods have been developed over the past years, and enzyme-assisted extraction is of sure one of the most interesting. Enzyme-assisted extraction has been recently applied for the recovery of carotenoids and betalines from different food waste by using standard commercial enzymes preparations. So um, in the enzyme-assisted extraction, different enzymes are usually applied in order to uh, hydrolyze the structural polysaccharides which constitute um, the plant cell wall, such as pectin, cellulose and hemicellulose. Our idea um, was to apply um, a tailored enzymatic mix for the hydrolysis of tomato cell wall and red beet cell wall um, for um, one objective. In the case of tomato, our aim was to recover um, pigments, so carotenoids, still contained in wall chromoplasts, preserving the structural integrity of their membrane in order to um, preserve the stability of pigment. In the case of uh, beta lines from red beet, um, the idea is the same, but in this case, a different um, tailored enzymatic mix has been designed for the recovery of free beta lines. So, uh, this research was aimed to develop a custom made protocol for the green extraction of carotenoids from unsold tomato and beta lines from unsold red beets by the cooperative action of different enzymes able to selectively hydrolyze the polysaccharides which constitute the cell wall. Firstly, a tailored enzymatic mix has been designed considering the cell wall composition of tomato and of red beets. Uh, after that, the suitable extraction conditions in terms of temperature, pH, enzymatic mix total dosage and process time have been identified in order to maximize the recovery yield of both pigments. And in the case of tomato, the application of a tailored enzymatic mix allowed us the recovery of carotenoids still contained in wall chromoplasts. Uh, firstly, the plant material, so tomato and red beets, have been characterized for the main chemical physical parameters and then for the cell wall polysaccharides composition. In the case of tomato, the enzyme assisted extraction protocol has been performed following sample pretreatment and alkaline pretreatment, which has been applied with the aim to dissolve the waxy layer responsible for cementing the cell wall, but without opening it. Um, in the case of enzyme-assisted extraction applied for the recovery of beta lines, also in, in this case, um, the enzyme-assisted extraction has been performed following uh, sample pretreatment. Um, moreover, considering that beta lines are uh, heat sensitive, we have performed the enzyme assisted extraction both at 45 degrees Celsius and at a lower temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. The commercial enzyme preparations we have used have been all characterized in terms of protein content, electrophoretic profile, and kinetic parameters. After that, 
um, a response surface methodology was applied in order to optimize the temperature and the um, pH um, with the aim to maximize the activity of all the enzymes applied together in the mix. Uh, and then the extraction process conditions have been optimized in terms of uh, treatment time and enzymatic mixed total dosage in order to maximize the recovery yield of both pigments, carotenoid containing chromoplasts and betalines. Finally, a color stability study uh, has been performed uh, storing the chromoplast uh, tomato extract obtained by enzyme assisted extraction under different conditions of temperature and light exposure. The color degradation kinetic and the color attributes have been investigated and compared with those of the free carotenoids tomato extract uh, recovered by the classical solvent extraction. The same stability study has been performed for red beet betaline extracts recovered uh, by enzyme-assisted extraction. So the first results we have obtained regarding tomato uh, prove that the tomato we have used in this study have the greatest ripening index corresponding to the highest content of carotenoids. Uh, concerning the cell wall polysaccharide composition, um, we have found, found that in the case of tomato, uh, the main structural polysaccharide was cellulose, fol um, followed by pectin and hemicellulose. These data allowed us uh, to design the tailored enzymatic mix, which contained cellulase, 57%. Polygalacturonase 26% and xylanase 17%. Uh, the commercial enzymes preparation have been uh, all characterized firstly in terms of uh, electrophoretic profile. Uh, for xylanase, we have found um, a dominant band at 24 kilodalton. For cellulase, we have found different band corresponding to different isoforms of this enzyme. In the case of polygalacturonase preparation, in addition to the main band at 69 kilodalton, um, another band at 40 kilodalton suggested the presence of a pectin lease activity, which was further confirmed by the kinetic characterization of the um, preparation. After that, um, the response surface methodology um, allowed us to identify the suitable conditions of temperature and pH for maximizing the activity of each enzyme. But in addition to um, this information, we have used um, an overlay plot. If you um, can see, uh, the shaded area in the overlay plot um, suggests us the suitable conditions of temperature and pH for maximizing the activity of all the enzymes when used together in the mix. So um, uh, the suitable conditions appear to be a temperature um, of about 45 55 degrees Celsius and a pH around 5. In the case of uh, tomato, uh, the optimization of the extraction process conditions has been performed uh, by different trials varying the process time and the enzymatic mix total dosage in order to maximize the recovery yield of carotenoid containing chromoplasts and the suitable conditions for maximizing the recovery yield appear to be the enzyme dosage 25 unit per gram and the process time of 180 minutes. Concerning the stability study 
um, the chromoplast extracts um, have been stored under three different temperatures, 4, 25 and 40 degrees Celsius in the dark or under UV light exposure. And uh, the degradation kinetic parameters have been compared with those of the free carotenoids recovered by the classical solvent extraction technique. Uh, among the different degradation kinetic parameters of great interest is K value corresponding to the rate constant. As you can see in this table, at four degrees Celsius in the dark, the K values did not significantly differ between chromoplasts and free carotenoids. However, under UV light, the lower rate constant was revealed for chromoplasts. And at 25 and 40 degrees Celsius, regardless of the different storage conditions and light exposure, the lowest K values were always found for chromoplasts, thus suggesting that chromoplast membrane um, better preserved the red-orange nuance of the pigments from both thermal and UV light degradation with respect to the free pigment recovered by solvent extraction. Concerning uh, um, beta lines, uh, concerning uh, red beads, uh, we have found a different cell wall polysaccharide composition, mainly characterized by similar percentages in terms of cellulose, hemicellulose, and pectin. So in this case, um, the Taylor enzymatic mix was designed as follows. Um, cellulase, 37%. Polygalacturonase 28% and xylanase 35%. Also, in this case, in order to maximize uh, the recovery yield of um, beta alines, different trials have been carried out um, bearing the process time and the enzymatic mix total dosage. When the enzyme assisted extraction was performed at 45 degrees Celsius, which is the optimal temperature for the, the application of the um, uh, enzymatic mix, the uh, suitable conditions for maximizing the recovery yield uh, appear to be enzymatic mix dosage of 25 units per gram and process time 120 minutes. However, considering that beta lines are heat sensitive, but also um, in view of an energy saving um, protocol uh, to be applied, we have performed the same trials at a lower temperature, at 25 degrees Celsius. And also in this case, uh, the uh, highest recovery yield of pigments was achieved using an enzymatic mix dosage of 25 units per gram, but extending the process time Time until 240 minutes. Also, in the case of um, beta lines extract, uh, the same color stability study has been performed under different temperature and light exposure conditions. And as shown in this table, in the dark, the K values increased as temperature increased for both betaxanthin and betaxanin, suggesting that pigment degradation is temperature dependent. Moreover, at four degrees Celsius, the K values did not significantly differ for betaxanthin and betaxanin when the storage was in the dark. And at 25 degrees Celsius, the degradation rate constant of um, betaxanins was slightly higher than that of betaxanthin. At the higher temperature, at 40 degrees Celsius, the K value was two times greater for betaxanins with respect to betaxanthins, thus suggesting that betaxanthin are more stable at higher temperatures than betaxanins. 
under UV light exposure at 4 and 25 degrees Celsius, similar degradation rate constant were found for both pigments. And uh, at 40 degrees Celsius, the degradation rate constant significantly differ uh, and was the highest for betaxanins. Also proving that betaxanthin are more stable also under UV light exposure than betaxanins. So, in conclusion, um, for tomato, we can say that a tailored enzymatic mix has been designed considering its polysaccharide composition and uh, carotenoids still contained in wall chromoplasts have been recovered by the cooperative action of the tailored enzymatic mix and the extraction process conditions has been optimized in order to maximize the recovery yield of pigment. After different storage conditions, Chromoplast was um, useful in preserving the uh, red orange nuance of carotenoids, more re with respect to the free carotenoids obtained by the classical solvent extraction, which was more um, sensitive to UV light and thermal degradation. Regarding beta lines from red beet, a tailored enzymatic mix has been developed considering the polysaccharide composition of red beet cell wall. Uh, the extraction process conditions, an enzyme-assisted extraction process, has been um, developed at uh, a low temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, in order to um, preserve the stability of the pigment, but also in view of uh, an energy saving uh, protocol. Under different storage conditions, betaxanthins appear to be more stable than betaxanins, both under UV light exposure and under um, high temperature. And here you can find uh, some papers published by our group, and uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. So is there any questions to ask? Uh, yes, hi, Ilaria. Hi. Thank you for your interesting presentation. I have just a curiosity to ask. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know if in your group you work also in enzyme preparation. Uh, and today, um, until today, we uh, use um, commercial food grade enzymes. Um, but um, we are starting a new project research for the recovery of enzymes from uh, plant material. Okay, and, uh, may I, I kindly ask you to share um, your email so may we can keep in touch because I would like to speak with you uh, some okay. uh, maybe joint work. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I will uh, share you. my contact. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you'll be getting the participation certificate within two to three days. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. So moving on to our next presentation by Dr. Vasilis Papas, Research Development and Innovation Consultant, R&D Manager at Condito Foods from Greece. Hello from me. Yes, yes. Go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, just a moment.
So do you, my presentation is okay. Please uh, update as a full It's visible. So let me. Is it okay? Yes, it's fine. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to talk about an uh, innovative ready to eat healthy product. Its name is uh, Chicken Boost from May to Zinc. So this product was developed in uh, 2020 as part of the European Food Innovation Competition at Ecotrophelia and qualified for the final phase. I was the project manager of this uh, project at the University of Virginia. So the beginning for this project was made with the view of the literature and the study of the trend of the time in the field of food, as well as the tendencies of consumers towards healthier and more nutritious foods. There has been a rapid increase in the world shift towards healthier and nutritious foods. We were also greatly impressed by the increased consumption of nutritional supplements without any pathological factor, but with the thought of the consumers that this way they would cope and haze for their wrong eating habits. This came mainly from the modern fast-paced lifestyle with long working hours that we all know. There were also population groups that consumed nutritional supplements due to increased needs, such as athletes, old people, or hard workers. So, based on the above, was born the idea of research and developing a product that would cover the basic daily nutritional needs in basic nutrients with only natural ingredients and with a combination of meat and vegetables. And with the basic advantage of being baked, frozen, and needing only 10 minutes of heating to be consumed. That's ready to eat. After researching the possible raw materials, we decided on the choice of chicken breast fillet as a base due to its special characteristics that are widely known, such as low fat, high protein content, of high biological value, and all. And the filling from a mixture of vegetables that go well with the chicken taste, food, as well as in terms of completeness of nutrients. So this is a photo of the product. Chicken Boost from A to Z is an ecological innovative product. It is a chicken based product stuffed with dehydrated vegetables such as kale, spinach, sun dried tomato, parsley, carrot, and dill. All the ingredients were produced in Greece. It's rich in vitamins, minerals, trace elements, and other nutrients. It is roasted and frozen to be consumed is required only mild heat. So it is a ready to eat main dish. Here is an explanation of the name, chicken, because the main ingredient of the product is chicken breast filling, boost, because the product offers to the consumer a large amount of nutrients and it is a boost of energy, and from A to zinc, because the product is a natural source of many vitamins, minerals, and trace elements from vitamin A to zinc. So here is the product innovation futures. It is a high nutrition ready to eat meal, only need warming up. It is a product that is a natural source of many vitamins, minerals, and trace elements. Consumer with only a portion of this product, about 170 grams, receives high percentages of the recommend, recommended daily intake. Without preservatives, chemical substances, and treatments, after analysis in the Greek and European food market for the last five years, it was not found that a product with this composition and with such high content of nutrients has been released without the use of an enrichment. And it is a combination of ingredients of plant and animal origin that ensures the intake of significant amounts of nutrients of the specific food group. So here we have the recipe in the target group. After the market analysis was completed and the trial results were evaluated, the following final recipe was determined. We see breast chicken fillet, spinach, kale, sun dried tomato, carrot, red pepper, and dill. And here is the percentage of each ingredient. The chicken boost from A to zinc is the ideal meat for consumers with fast paced lives who follow a healthy lifestyle 
and with increased nutritional needs. It was tested by head members of the industry trade evaluators and scored on a scale of one to nine with the following five factors, appearance, taste, texture, aroma, and overall image. So here we can see the results show that the average for each of the above factors were such there. After all, the product has acceptable sensory characteristics and its development is protected smoothly. So here we can see the nutrition statement of the product. We can see the energy is about 327 kilocal per portion. Portion is about 170 grams. It's high protein, low salt, and the saturated is only 1.7. After that, you can see the nutrition claims. It's lower sodium, high protein. It's a natural product because chicken wool from A to Z contains only natural ingredients without chemical substances. It also contains beta carotene, glycopen, omega-3 fatty acid, omega-6 fatty acid, and all the essential amino acid per portion, which are not synthesized by organism and therefore must be obtained through diet. It's a source of many vitamins and minerals such as calcium, zinc, copper, and vitamin B1, B12, and vitamin D. Here is the table with the vitamins and minerals that contains the product. We can see that in vitamin D, it's about 16% per portion. Here is also the name of vitamins and mineral that is high in chicken bush from A to zinc. We can see through the table vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K, C, a lot of vitamin B complex, folic acid, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, iron, manganese, and selenium. Here is the percentages for each vitamin. So the above was in chemical analysis and here is the results. Protein is about 22.5, copper and iron, and vitamin B12. According to the analysis in a laboratory in Germany, the high content of nutrients in the product is confirmed. So the, the content of nutrients that uh, have been literature approved in the analysis in the laboratory. Here we have some possible beneficial properties of the ingredients according to the international scientific literature. Chicken breast pellet, it's a protein of high biological value, increased content of essential amino acids, increased B vitamins, and especially B12 content which improves movement, nervous system, function, and memory. Egg yolk powder is high in vitamin D content, responsible for proper development and growth of bones, good immune function, and prompting the overall health of the body. It's, it has the ability to increase high density lipoprotein, resulting in reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. Kale is, it has increased content of vitamins A, C, and K, which contribute to the proper function of the immune system. It has high calcium content, helping to maintain maximum bone density and reduce the risk of osteoporosis. Spinous, it has high potassium and low sodium content, a combination that helps lower blood pressure. It has significant amount of coenzyme Q12, Q10, which helps to strengthen muscles and prevent cardiovascular diseases. We we'll go ahead with sun dry tomato that increased lycopen content, known for anti-cancer and antioxidant characteristics. Sun dry tomato has an excellent source of fiber and iron, which is responsible for the formation of red blood cells, producing fatigue and strengthening the immune system. Carrot is high 
vitamin A content, which helps to reduce vision problems. Also, carrot has high content of beta carotene, whose action is mainly antioxidant, but at the same time contributes to the health of hair and skin. Red pepper is rich in vitamin B, especially folic acid B9, which contributes to the function of the cardiovascular system. Dill is rich in vitamin C, which acts as a powerful antioxidant and enhances the function of the immune system. It contains also potassium, iron, calcium, and magnesium, as well as valuable antioxidants, which protect the body from the risk of developing chronic disease. Here we can see the production progress process of the, of the chicken bush from A to Z. We have the receipt of raw materials. After the preparation of vegetables, we go ahead with kneading, tenderizing chicken fillets, weighing and mixing vegetables, filling, weighing the filling to the product. After that, chicken stuffing and tying. We we'll go ahead with the product is baked for 20 minutes, freezing in a freezing stoner, packaging, storage at minus 18 Celsius, and distribution with refrigerated trucks. Here we can see in the table the process of the product. So we have done a microbiological analysis in vesicle analysis such as salmonella E. coli and listeria. And after that, the self life duration is the result of the later microbiological and stability tests is about eight months. The storage conditions, the product must be frozen at minus 18 degrees Celsius. We have done a CCP and opiates in the HASP project. Any pathogens that have survived or developed in earlier stages do not survive in the food is given proper treatment. The goal is to keep the temperature in the center of the product at 75 degrees Celsius for two minutes to kill any pathogens. This is achieved with a baking temperature greater than 75 degrees Celsius. We have opiates also. And here we can see the short analysis of the product. It's strange that it's innovative special product, high nutritional value, it's low in fat, natural Greek product, ready to eat meal, and high shelf life. The opportunity is to return to healthy way of life. It's a new kind of fast nutritional and healthy meals, and it has a rapid development of social media opportunity for economic advertising. The weakness is that a high production cost in this product, and the threat is that the appearance of competitors in a short time. We can see the four piece analysis about product, its address to consumers with fast paced lives and obtain the recommended amounts of daily nutrients. Promotion is a sponsorship or presenting exhibitions like this. Play it is everything in Horeca and the price is similar price to competitors and many retailers. Here we have a cost analysis, but with the new international economic conditions, the cost of the product is continuously increasing. So I am not able now to tell you a final selling price of this product. We have a view of the packaging. We have a plastic vessel. On top of that, a membrane. And after board, a cardboard. Here we can see the packaging with the photo of the product, all the ingredients and vitamins and minerals. So all the project has ecological characteristics of the packaging. It's a PLA plastic, 100% recyclable and 3D printed. Also, the cardboard is 100% recyclable. All the materials follow the requirements of the legislation. Here we can see the environmental impact. At the green beans, raw materials are produced locally, thus shortening the transport distances to industry, thereby reducing the emissions of transport vehicles. At the manufacturing process level, 
the production of the product in industry uses the minimum possible energy in order to emit the minimum possible pollutants. Also, the byproducts resulting from the production process are used to produce pesticide and energy. At the packaging level, the product is packaged within the industry, so no energy is needed to move the product to another packaging industry. As we informed you before, the packaging material is fully recyclable. At company management level, the company applies an ISO 14001 environmental management system. It has a biological purification is applied to solid and liquid waste resulting from the production process. From the solid waste, after the production process, a pesticide is produced. All industry byproducts are utilized for energy and production. So the future actions of this project is submitting the prescription to the Hellenic industrial property organization in order to obtain the intellectual property rights and of course offering an innovative product to consumers with a particularly high nutritional value only from natural sources. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vasilios Papas. So is there any questions to ask? So thank you once again. Thank you too. Have a nice day. Yes, yes. So you'll be getting the participation certificate within two to three days. Okay, thank you. Okay, fine, fine. Moving on to your next presentation by Dr. Mohamed Zarid from University Zar Politiciana, the Kartigana from Spain. So he has submitted the video presentation. We'll share on the screen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Niger, of this event, and especially Elena Watt, as well today, we'll try to present some results of our research about the new bright uh, information. Uh, I'm watching the beginning and we're sitting on the question.
And then we'll have to advance as uh, high pickup uh, in the specific individual value and, and the small genome uh, which can be uh, technologically exploited. Development and textual changes that we're doing to drive the goals of the studies we were developing to our policy and other models. So, this is the first part. Of a selected community in line of a not the master of the world, the master of the world, the master the world, the in the world, the of the world, but also the textual case and all of what I do is to link this group in progress metrics on right the world. Uh, children and uh, using gene expression all the time of the part of the temple or using the movie of the lion. So uh, the mirror of the second is going to of the student writing where uh is of uh Kariza and I could Russian related to uh, from uh, uh, John Black Trump, a variety, according to a variety, into the years when they suffered Spanish cultivar. How about the combination of the Mediterranean conditions for a patchy country in the sewer in the south of Spain? Uh, regarding the signal effects, uh, several factors. Those may affect volatile production and for the next composition, which will be beginning because the food in this quadrant people have been tolerated in signal and the environmental conditions during. Uh, during uh, ripening or uh, during production. You can need the seasonal effects. Precipitation was important only in season one. Precipitation. And uh, in season one, maximum temperature well less than 65. To the maximum temperature uh, uh, from fruit. Never decreased below 20 degrees. Regarding geological behavior and sector traits, sector traits analysis results at harvest show similar differences. And both students and significant impact of the progress and control, which is the hardness, flash burnout, or flash burnout of the observed uh, hazards. Harvested in both students with the intersection of the uh, uh, density. And purposes. For the aroma of
where uh, standard uh, univariate and multivariate analysis actually brought an organic compound where the first is involved in the compound. Compared to uh, the almost a high of this uh, experiment. Thanks to this other organic compound after from season one, but it seems to be doing. Some alcohol, silent cut, and acetate state one, second, different drive compounds, six, not acetate state, and four other volatiles of. All that compound. Uh, compounds were first in season one and first in season two. But only since the uh, water organic compound which are two methyl butanol, two methyl tenzanol, we want we want uh exanal exactly and five two six three seventeen on where this will not bring factor according to the The organic water organic compound which is called to be the two And uh, in our experiment, three compounds were detected the same one with the and eleven were the best of the the Difference of the uh, with uh, Uh, 
Organic compounds derived from mainly affect the society by activating function. You can see here with an exercise how can be case difference with uh, resulting in different experience depending on the financial conditions during growing through sex and development. Three of the five compounds were genuinely derived from amino acids, and the acids and Although the precursors of some of the compounds reported here, namely uh, amino acids such as the seen and L, the seen, the value, and Jonah will increase. of alcohol and the derived by the derived by the and so are some other high and other derived compounds. This amino acid may also also as to the precursor of some sisters, the precursor of some sisters, derived compounds. Maybe how many is the same as another because of the process of another than one of the kinds. Also, you know, like the passages of two, if you look at exam one, all, as you can see here in the table, in the volatile precursion. How the identified links or the link between our and its of states are harder. The first cor uh, correlation coefficient between text of States and volatile organic compounds in season one. And a problem of the really good time to do. And uh, the other table is for season two. I mean, In the uh, table six. So this is the difference between between uh, look uh, its voice is not clear. Please close this video presentation and uh, please invite another one. Next one. Regarding the transcriptomic analysis. The theme of the study was to analyze the compact transcription of the period of the and this will be after for until new Better to stop uh, presentation. Well, significant effects of the factors having during college. All of them, the language of so there are a lot of disturbances in Muhammad Zarif video presentation. So we are closing. This presentation. So we are going to invite the next presenter, uh, Dr. Christiana Boxen, Harvard Medicine School, initiative from RNA Medicine from USA. Uh, Dr. Christiana, please share your screen.
Dr. Christiana, are you there? Are you there, Dr. Christina? Hi. Good yes. afternoon. I, I lost my connection for, for a few seconds. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, may I start? Yes, yes, you can. Okay. It's my, my, my screen is okay. Yes, yes. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, I would like to, to, to thank you for the, the invitation to be part of this conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And I will talk about the milk uh, extracellular vesicles changes during the fermentation process. Um, we, we use it to, to have uh, milk as a, a main matrix, food matrix to, to functional foods and dairy products are the main delivery for, for bio, biogenic compounds uh, and the in functional food market. And the milk uh, is a, a crucial for, for newborn growth and development. And then they present uh, an essential nutrition um, components. And uh, when we talk about milk, we think and uh, nutrition, we think in, in breast milk, uh, human breast milk. But when we we and the, the this this time of lactation, we still eating milk uh, for for uh, in, in a lot of dairy products. Then the milk composition. Uh, they can change depend, uh, depends on the maternal diet, uh, not just for us, but for all animals. And they are compounded mainly by water, carbohydrates, protein, fat, but it still have some microbial communities like staphylococcus and streptococcus that they are prevalent uh, and some, some bio compounds like micronet that are very important for immunity and, and, and development of the, 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 the people. The milk composition, they, they, with human and cow, they share the, the, the main components like oligosaccharides, proteins, fat, and lactose, but they, they they present different contents of microRNAs and different contents of proteins and other biogenic compounds like fatty acids. But we analyze here, uh, our focus is in microRNAs. And the microRNAs delivered by human uh, milk usually are present in exosomes uh, and they are very different concentration and pattern from different milks. Uh, from different species. Uh, but these microRNAs from different species could, uh, could express the, the, the same, the same uh, interference in the, the immune, immune system uh, in the interspecies. So what, what are the extracellular vesicles? Uh, uh, extracellular vesicles are nano-size nano based uh, particles that are, 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 um, are developed for the cells, but also not just for the cells, uh, mammal cells, but also 
from from uh, prokaryote cells, uh, and they are uh, the the size of they, they could be uh, uh, divided in micro vesicles and exons or or uh, apoptotic uh, extracellular vesicles, depend on the size and the, the composition of the membrane of these these vesicles. So in mammalian cells and milk, uh, we have in the milk we have uh, the mammalian cells and some bacterial extracellular vesicles compound these exosomes and and these uh, extracellular vesicles from milk they they are stable in in, in solutions in different sol uh, st uh, solutions they are acid resistant and they can penetrate from the mucus in the the tracheogastric intestinal in the in intestinal uh, uh, tracheogastric these are extracellular vesicles are, are uh, delivered for not just from the epithelial cells of the mammary glamour uh, group, but also from the macrophage uh, T cells and other immune cells. Then they compound this kind of, of extracellular vesicles of milk. So the 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 health of the mother uh, and the the, the animal. Uh, the diet will change the pattern of the, the components of these extracellular vesicles. But in general, the, the cow milk that we use today reproducts have a, a, a pattern pre stabilized of these uh, extracellular vesicles. And the literature shows that in raw milk, we can find these extracellular vesicles with the, 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 the content of proteins and microRNAs well stabilized, uh, established. But when you homogenize, uh, pasteurize, and cold storage to produce the commercial milk, we lose a lot of these extracellular vesicles. And during the fermentation process, uh, the, the literature shows that the process uh, destroy all extracellular vesicles, then we don't have the, the, the interspecies uh, interference. In our previous uh, studies, we saw some, some interference, then we will see what happened during the fermentation process. Uh, in which point of the fermentation these extracellular vesicles are destroyed and uh, what happened with this cargo. So for this, we got the free fat pasteurized milk and we fermented with the, the, the yogurt uh, mix uh, bacteria that is the Streptococcus thermophilus and Lactobacillus the, the Brook bulgaricus to produce the dairy, the yogurt uh, product. And uh, we we produce the we, we inoculate the microorganisms, fermentate until reach pH four point seven at four two uh, degrees Celsius, cooling in ice bath, stirring and and then distributing cups until uh, the the analysis. Uh, we check at five different points. Uh, to analyze these uh, extracellular vesicles from the, the first point when we inoculate the, the bacteria, when they reach pH 6, 5.5, 5, and 4.7. These are uh, our five checkpoints to, to analyze these extracellular vesicles. The isolation methodology used was the, the differential centrifugation. Uh, followed by size exclusion chromatography and ultrafiltration. Uh, then we, we analyze these extracellular vesicles. The characterization of them was made by electron, uh, transmission electron microscopy. And we saw that in, in milk, in the, the, the first point when we inoculate the, the yogurt bacteria, we can see the extracellular vesicles. But when they reach pH 4.7 until 4.5, we, 
we can still see, we still found some extracellular vesicles. So they were not destroyed by fermentation, they still there, but the amount of them they should be not enough. And not just the extracellular vesicles from milk, but also some extracellular vesicles from the, the bacteria. Bacteria, uh, they, the bacteria used are gram, uh, positive bacteria, then they release the, 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 the extra uh, cellular membrane to form uh, uh, the extracellular vesicles. And then we can see, we, we could see in the yogurt both of these, these extractors. When we characterize for the nano, nano track analysis to, to analyze the concentration of these uh, extracellular vesicles, uh, we thought, saw that in the milk we have an homogeneous uh, size uh, and, a, and a concentration of uh, 10 to, to 11 particles uh, per ml. And these, these bacteria are, are, these extracellular vesicles are very stable with a, a zeta potential around minus uh, 31. Uh, and, and in a really homogeneous uh, size. When we analyze during the fermentation, the, these extracellular vesicles, we can see a degradation in the number. So to, uh, from 10 to 11, we reach 10 to 8 uh, nanoparticles per ml, but we can see a different pattern. Uh, in the milk, we have the particle size in uh, 145 nanometers and in the 5.5 pH we can see the, the particles of 50 nanometers that is, is from, uh, from bacteria, extracellular vesicles and the, the, we can see a particle that are, are double size of the, the initial uh, initial size and the zeta potential tends to go to zero. This meaning that the, the extracellular particles, uh, the, the extracellular vesicles, they have a, a, a tendency to, uh, to, 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 to get instable in the, the media and with this instability, they could be or destroyed or fused with other particles. Then when they reach the pH 4.5, they return to stability. We still have some instability, but we have some particles that are really stable in the media and we have different uh, three uh, different size of particle. We have we still have the, the bacterial extracellular vesicle, we, we have the, the, the milk extracellular vesicle and the other two uh, particles in different size. And so we, uh, what we saw that the milk uh, extracellular vesicles decrease to 10 to 11 and to 10 to 8 uh, uh, nanoparticles per ml, but they are still there. If they are still there, which cargo they have? So we analyze the microRNA cargo through, through the Marexis platform that we analyze 196 uh, different microRNAs. And we saw that after the fermentation, we have a total different pattern of microRNAs. So when we compare just the, 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 the non-coding RNAs from the, the bacteria uh, that have homology of the, the microRNAs from milk, and when we compare the fermented milk, we, we can see a, a huge difference in the content, but they still there. So we can conclude that the milk fermentation uh, resulted in a loss uh, of EVs and a, a change in the morphology of these EVs. 
we, we can see a lot in no-coding RNAs uh, of the bacteria and milk uh, if we associate after milk processing, but they, they are still there uh, in a, a amount that is possible to, to produce some interference in the, the host. So when we take the dairy, dairy products, we are taking some extracellular vesicles with microRNAs that could modulate our, our immune system. And these extracellular particles could be used as a um, postbiotic. Uh, and they change this cargo and the pattern of the, 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 the extracellular vesicles change during fermentation is depending uh, on the, the bacteria that you use to ferment and to produce your, your dairy product and depend on the time of fermentation. And this is what I, I, I bring today to share with you. And thank you for your attention. And I would like to, to, to thank uh, my, my, uh, my, my lab and my institution. Thank you very much, Dr. Cristiano. So is there any questions to ask? So thank you once again. Thank you once again. You're getting the participation certificate within two to three days. Moving on to our next presentation by Dr. Balaji Vasudevan, Agrobiosense Chief Scientist, UM6P Ventures from USA. Uh, shall I go ahead now? Yes, yes. Please share your screen. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Is it my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Oh, fine. Okay, fine. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about uh, crop genome editing innovations and what's going on with respect to genome editing from the regulatory perspective globally. So why we should even talk about genome editing? That's because uh, of numerous challenges and one of the most important challenges that humanity faces is the ever-growing population and how to feed those population. The population is going to hit about 9 billion by 2050 and even beyond. As, they, as we pass by, but with the number of shrinking resources, such as land, water, and crop genetics, and lack of biodiversity, climate change is a big problem of feeding the population. As you can see from this infographic, it's very clear that we have only 0.2 hectare per person. That's the only amount of land available for, for about 9 billion people is just 0.2 hectare per person. And you have to feed, grow the crops within that small amount of land and decreasing water and land resources to feed the population, and which is a very, very, challenging and a humid task because there are about 1 billion people that go hungry every day. Uh, that's because of uh, severe food insecurity. And uh, and uh, we see when, when we see what are those driving factors that is responsible for this uh, innovation investment because in order to feed those 9 billion people, we need agri-food tech in, 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 invention and innovations. Uh, we cannot be growing, growing and doing agriculture in the same way as we are now in order to manage those ever-increasing ever population. So in order to feed those uh, agri-tech innovations, we need a lot of investments from various sectors. So what are those innovations? What are the driving factors for innovations? As I mentioned in infographic, it's pandemic in the crops, climate change, shrinking water and land resources, and rising costs of biofertilizers and biofertilizers and all the agri-inputs needed for agriculture, and the uh, decreasing farm workers, and global harmonization increase and a lot of stress, both biotic stress as well as from abiotic stress, and which all under population increase. These are many of some of the driving factors which is needed for the agri food innovations. And uh, when it come, what are the technologies that is feeding these innovations? And there are a lot of technologies in the agri food tech that is going on right now, starting from gene editing to genetically modified crops to synthetic biology to artificial uh, or cultivated meat or uh, alternative proteins, biopesticides, biologicals, 
and you have precision agriculture, uh, artificial intelligence is making a wave now, and you have a lot of technologies in the food waste arena, which is a $1 trillion problem. And of course, the most important thing is the regenerative agriculture, where people are trying to regenerate the soil uh, and also the biodiversity. So these are some of the technologies that I mentioned, which are feeding the agri-food tech innovations. A lot of investments is going on in these areas. And one of the technology, most important technology that is uh, being adopted worldwide is gene editing or gene, genome editing. So what is exactly gene editing? It is nothing but the intervention of the DNA at the molecular level. You can just make a precise change at the wherever in the region, whatever in, if you want, using variety of tools. In order, you don't insert any foreign gene here. You just change the existing base pairs, few base pairs in order to give a new trait. And why we should do even gene editing in the first place? Because when you take crops, all these crops and all the food we are eating right now, those all come from breeding, the traditional conventional breeding. But the problem there is the traditional breeding takes about eight to 10 years in order to develop one crop variety. And then came the mutation breeding. The mutation breeding is nothing but exposing the seeds to chemical mutagens and also to radiations, and then develop a trait from that because of the chemically induced mutation. Again, it takes eight to 10 years. And the next came the transgenic, which is GMO. It's a good technology, but again, the again most of the countries have not uh, adopted the GMO. They are, they have a ban, and also it takes a lot of money, about five hundred million dollars, to get one trait in the span of about ten years. And then came the recent invention that is genome editing, where you can bring a trait to the market within four to five years. And uh, most of the countries now slowly adopting the uh, uh, approving the gene editing uh, process. So that's how gene editing is becoming an important thing in the picture. And also you see the market. What is the market for the gene editing in the CRISPR gene editing? It is going to touch about 3.7 billion by about 2030. So gene editing is progressing at a very rapid fast. And when you see what are the advantages in the gene editing technology that happened over the years, CRISPR-Cas9, everybody knows that's very famous right now for the gene editing tool. But before CRISPR-Cas9, there were something called Megan nucleases, uh, zinc finger nucleases, and talents. And then came the CRISPR-Cas9. And now there are a lot of variations of CRISPR that is available depending on what the researchers want to do. Uh, but now CRISPR-based gene editing is the key tool for gene editing in anything. It could be microbes, plants, animals, human, and everywhere CRISPR-based Cas nucleases are the dominant tools for the gene editing. And uh, even before the CRISPR, as I told you, there are about four types of uh, nucleases available in general. One is zinc figure nucleases, which are the very first to do the gene editing. And then came Talon, and then came Cas9, and then came CPF1. All the different tools for the gene editing, they all do the essentially the same thing in a different way. They all recognize the DNA, at the specific point, cuts the DNA wherever you have designed who wants the nucleus to cut. And because and there is a break in the DNA because of the cut, and the DNA gets joined by DNA repair process. And as a result of that, you get random mutation and the ultimately a knockout. So how CRISPR-Cas9 is used essentially, as I told you, it makes a precise cut in a, in a specific area of the genome. And after that, the cut is made, a double standard break is created, and then it is repaired. There are two kinds of repair mechanism available in plants, it is mainly through what is called as NHEJ, non-homologous enjoining recombination, whereas in the case of the uh, 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 yeast and human and other, other uh, species, it is HDR, homology de dependent recombination. In the case of the plants, uh, the, the DNA gets repaired by NHEJ pathway, and ultimately results in what's called gene knockout. And, uh, and uh, in addition to the gene knockout, the gene editing can also do what is called as the gene modification and gene insertion through HDR homology dependent repair. And one of the key problems in the CRISPR-based gene editing technology is the delivery of the CRISPR gene editing reagents into the target cells, in this case, plants. So what are the steps involved in CRISPR-mediated gene editing? The first one is you have to identify what are the target you want to, you want to edit. So identification of the target and then design of your gRNA, a single guide RNA, and then assemble the construct containing the Cas nucleus and the gRNA. And then what happens, whether it could be a single gene editing or a multiplex gene, multiplex gene editing. And once the construct and every reagent is ready, you want to just introduce or deliver into the host cells, which is a major bottleneck at, the, at this time, particularly for plants. And once you get the gene edited plant a trait, then you want to confirm whether it's really gene edited. Then there comes the molecular analysis like real-time PCR, Sanger sequencing, NGS, NGS sequencing, and other variety of tools. 
and once the once the once the plant is confirmed by molecular analysis then it's confirmed it's, it's taken for the phenotypic analysis whether it, it's supposed to perform in the way it, it, it was anticipated then after after several rounds of field trials and other analysis it is taken to the market and the regulatory approval and then market so these are the steps in the crispr based gene editing so as a, the 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 key the key problem as i told in the gene editing there are many problems but one of the key essential thing is the delivery of the gene editing reagents into your target cells in this case the plant cells so what are the delivery tools that is available mainly most of the people use agrobacterium that's a biological way of delivering your gene editing tools into the into the plants the other one is non biological or physical some of the physical methods include gene gun one is the gene gun like this the other one is a protoplast based transfection the other one is mrna using gene gun and uh, you have pig mediated protoplast transfection and viral mediated delivery which is called virus induced gene editing which is getting very popular these days and the other one is implanted delivery directly delivering into the plants without avoiding the tissue culture so there are different ways of delivering the gene editing reagents it all depends on which plant and which methodology a researcher chooses there are pros and cons of each and every one of the methodology but the most uh, widely adopted and most inexpensive way of doing is through agrobacterium which is one of the uh, bi the biological delivery that is used for about 30 40 years uh, to to develop genetically modified plants and now a gene edited plants and if you see in all along the way for the past 10 years it's been 10 years since the crispr was discovered and if you see well, the amount of research that has gone into 10 years it's 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 enormous and mind boggling and if and 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 there are all along this all along the way in the past 10 years there are a lot of technological innovation that happened in each and every step of the gene editing starting from the target identification doing the vectoring the meaning constructing the construct assembling the construct and type choosing the editing type whether it's a base editing or it's a knockout or a knock in or a prime editing there are different kinds and different types of nucleases that's available variety of tools are available now and dna delivery mechanism as i explained and which is a dna dna based delivery or a protein based delivery and then in vivo expression tissue culture regeneration for the plants and uh, screening of the genome related events using molecular tools and then phenotypic assays and ultimately comes the trade development uh, and regulatory uh, steps so a lot of innovations that has happened in all these years and uh, uh, depending on uh, and uh, depending on the 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 researcher the funding available people go with the different kinds of tools available either by themselves or collaborating with other partners in order to speed up the process so in in addition so so the for the previous slide I explained all the innovation that was happening but in spite of all these efforts that is going on in gene editing space still there are some problems and challenges and limitations with the gene editing that's what this infographic explains so what are those challenges first not all the crops are unable to amenable to gene editing because some of the crops we don't know the genome or the genome is unannotated or is very partial when that is the case then you cannot use those crops for gene editing and then when the crop is uh, polyploid or heterozygous there is very the efficiency of gene editing is very low and delivery as i said is very is, is problematic and virus induced gene editing is good but the problem is you cannot put more cargo more genes into the virus because of the packaging issue and the crop transformation and regeneration is again a problem because because not all the crops you can regenerate and transform easily and when you want to do gene gene knockins using gene editing uh, the efficiency is very low uh, there are improvements but it is low at this time and multiplex gene editing because nowadays people are not going after one gene they are going after two three even 10 20 genes in at the same time multiplex gene editing is becoming common but still the efficiency is low people are trying to improve their efficiency and one of the major uh, uh, the negative points about gene editing is people talking about this ote the off target effects but uh, this uh, this has been severely addressed these days and there are a lot of ways to uh, overcome uh, this otes and now the gene editing is becoming more uh, precise and uh, when you take what is the application of the gene editing why we have to gene do gene editing because gene editing can be used for a variety of trait improvements starting from uh, 
and what are starting from for example the the cartoons here explain you know, the various types of diseases which are listed as crop pandemic we, we all know that covid 19 came it was classified as a human pandemic similarly crops are undergoing threats from various diseases bacterial fungal and viral diseases and these are the diseases i have mentioned like back by fusarium wilt of banana leaf rust in coffee late blight of potato and uh, pierce disease in uh, grapes and olives and downy mildews of grape all these diseases are classified as crop pandemic diseases and is threatening the, uh, the growth and cultivation of all these crops worldwide. And one of the technology that can be used to protect all these crops is gene editing. So when you, when you, when, when you dig deep into gene editing, what can be achieved with gene editing? It goes from say, when you want to do, do a gene knockout, you can do that. When you want to do a gene knock-in, again, you can do it via editing. And then you can activate a gene and then you can silence a gene using CRISPR, CRISPR-A, CRISPR-I. And base editing, you can just change one base, just only one base, base editing. And you can do epigenic modifications and nuclear rearrangement. And nowadays, uh, all the genome editing we have been talking so far, mainly focused on editing gene or DNA at the DNA level. But there is something called RNA editing, meaning you can edit the RNA state at the RNA instead of even without touching the DNA. And latestly, there is a few papers out there which also say that, prove that you can edit the protein directly. It's called protein editing. So the editing has come from DNA to RNA, now even to the protein. So such is the advancement of this technology. So, but with all this said, you, if you are all the, there are many companies working on getting gene editing products to the market, but the, one of the most important challenging from the, from a non-technical point is the regulatory. You need to get the regulatory approval from your concerned government, wherever they are working, in order to release or take your product to the market. So that's where the regulatory uh, step comes in. And when you see, uh, the conventional breeding, the crops that, that are raised, the trays that are raised to conventional breeding, it is accepted universally across all countries. It's not regulated. When it is GMO, it is accepted only in a few countries. There are about 30 countries which, which have accepted GMO, whereas all the other countries have still banned the GMO. It's strictly regulated. When it comes to gene editing, it is approved in about 25 countries or so as we speak. And still, it is not approved, or it's in the process of approval in other countries. So it's in the, it's, it's 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 a bag of both. It is regulated in in majority of countries, and not regulated in about thirty countries or so at this point of time. And when it comes to the regulatory process, what are the what are the what are the how 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 does a regulatory body in a given country approach gene editing? So it's mainly classified in two types. One is product based, other one is process based. The classical example for product based category is United States. United States is the first country in the world to approve gene editing, and it was the first country to approve the release of the gene edited product in the market in 2019, which was a high poly XYB. And uh, uh, whereas the uh, in, in the case of process based, the best example is European Union. All the countries that comes under European Union, where they have not still approved gene editing, and uh, they, for them it doesn't matter whether the final product is GM or not. Even if the, some of the earliest steps as as a GM process, still it is considered as a GM. So which is very very strict and very tight over there. So so most of the countries that are approved gene editing. They, whenever the gene editing is done using SDN1 technology and SDN2 technology, most of the 32 countries have approved gene editing when the crops are developed using the first two. But all the countries, including United States, have did not approve when the when gene editing is done via SDN3. So SDN1 means there is no template DNA. All you are doing is changing the existing DNA inside a plant. In the case of SDN2, or you are you are introducing a small piece of uh, external DNA, but external DNA sequence is exactly same to your endogenous plant DNA with a few modifications, one or two base chain. That's it. So these plants from via SDN1, SDN2 are not considered as GMO. It is exempted from regulation about 30 countries. Whereas in the case of SDN3, it is strictly considered as a GMO and it is kind of banned. And, and you have to go through a strict regulatory process, which would take about 10 years to get the product out to the market. And this map shows the current regulatory landscape across the world. As I said, there are about 19 countries in this listed, listed here on the left of the slide. 
starting from United States all the way to Switzerland. But this number has increased to about 25 to 30 now. This slide was prepared a little bit longer. So it's a little bit 19 is there. But now the number has increased. Every single day we see news saying that uh, a new country has adopted gene editing. So the number is increasing up to 30 and it's increasing even more. For example, all those in dark green, in the, in, the, in the map, like United States, Australia, India, for example, and many countries in South America, they have approved gene editing. But you see the red, red marks here, that is European Union. That is strictly uh, not adopted gene editing. But there is uh, one good news is that some, uh, the European Union has now taken up gene editing and is considering, ado considering the ado uh, adoption of gene editing. And there was a news out there about two weeks back. And now, uh, uh, why why these regulatory bodies are very strict in the case of adopting gene editing in at least in in, in some countries is that you know they're weighing the risk and benefits of the genometer products and if you see what are the benefits of the genometer products first it is low cost it takes only four to five years to develop a product via gene editing and the cost is about 20 to 25 million dollars compared to gmo which is about 300 to 500 million dollars a reduced time four to five years versus about 10 years and it can be applied to a variety of trade development like abiotic stress and biotic stress like pest and diseases, disease tolerance. It can be used to develop climate proof crops. And it can be used to develop crops that can fertilize themselves, self-fertilizing crops without the addition of the external bioagri inputs. And then it can be crops that can be used to delay the food waste, reduce food waste. Like there was one paper out that they, they silenced a gene in melon and now they have a melon which doesn't go bad. Or, or waste uh, because of the the ripening so and then uh, fewer off target mutations compared to other technology and if you see the mutation rate here i specifically mentioned when you see the conventional breeding technology where the crops are developed using a chemical or radiation based induced mutation it is 1000x more than the natural mutation that occurs in the that occurs naturally but when you take the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing mutation rate, it is almost close to the natural one. It's about 5 to 140 per genome, which is way, way, way less than what is going on with the conventional breeding process, uh, which has been used for the past 40, 50 years to develop all the type of food we are eating right now. So CRISPR-Cas9 based gene editing is very safe and it is way, way, way lower in compared to the even the conventional breeding in terms of the mutation rate. And when you when you come to the, the regulatory bodies, USDA is one of the premier body in the world uh, and was the first to approve the gene editing. And if you see USDA as a, as a process called AAR, am I regulated? All the all the all the uh, the company and the startups or the global company who are involved in gene editing product development has to share their data to the USDA in this process called AAR. And then the USDA, if it, if it gives the approval, then they are good to go. They can do all kinds of field trials and get to the market very easily. There are about 168 entries to date in the USDA AAR website. Uh, 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 all these 168 entries belongs to different companies, whether it is a global company, whether it is a startup or a mid-size or a global company. They are all got their product approved by the USDA for the gene editing. And uh, this, this is some of the gene editor products that has been approved by the USDA and uh, deregulated. One is sulfonylurea canola coming from a company called Severs in San Diego. The other one is a non-browning mushroom. Other one is a, a powdery mildew resistant wheat. And you have high holy soybean coming out of a company called Calix. It is the first gene editor product approved, commercialized, and marketed in the world. Next one is Vaxi corn coming out of Cortiva AgriScience here in the US. And this is a disease resistant uh, uh, rice coming out, uh, uh, approved. So, and there are there are about uh, more than 100 to 200 companies working all around the world on gene editing. And some of the companies are listed here, starting to the likes of BASF, Cartiva, Bayer, Syngenta, all the global ones, and something like Seabus, Benson Hill, Yield 10. These are the mid sized companies. I've just listed a few. There are about hundreds of companies working on the gene editing. So when it comes to the, as I said, the regulatory framework, regulatory, each one of the countries have their own set of rules uh, regarding the regulation of the gene editing. So from my perspective, I thought that what could be the ideal regulatory policy and framework? Uh, so based the regulatory policy, in my opinion, should be based on science and data driven. That is the key thing. The, all the all the rules and regulations should be re, should be strictly based on science and it should be data driven. And in sometimes you have to include social and economic considerations depending on the country. And the food security and sustainability has to be taken into question. And conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. 
and compliance with biosafety measures and it should be clear concise and time bomb the timing is very important the amount of the duration because otherwise you cannot bring your own product to the market and it should never be politically driven influence that is a key factor because otherwise you cannot bring good science to the market or the benefit of the people and the planet so these are some of the points that has to be taken into consideration while devising the ideal uh, or workable regulatory policy and framework and uh, as I said, CRISPR gene editing is one of the tools. It's not the only tool. It's the one of the tools that has to be taken into consideration to achieve what is the zero angle goal proposed by the UN. So as we see this chart, we can see that the, the, the number of malnourished and undernourished people is increasing day by day. It's about 0.84 billion uh, by 2030 and current is about 0.68 billion. And if you see the, the total food shortage that is expect current is about uh, 1.4 uh, total food shortage that they expect is about 1.4 billion tons. So how to how to how to produce all this uh, amount of food and feed the ever increasing population of about eight or nine billion people? Uh, CRISPR gene editing could be one of the technology one, is one of the key technology to be adopted in the generation of nutritious and uh, uh, high value tra traits in in crops. So, uh, from my perspective, gene editing will be adopted as we speak by many countries as in the years to come. Uh, that is one of the technology to achieve fast uh, uh, food and agricultural transformation. That is fast so sustainability transformation. So, what is being what what do I expect or what are the expectations for gene editing in the next five years or next ten years? Number one. So far, we have been editing at the DNA level. Now it's up to protein. And now you can edit even the chromosome. So instead of one gene, you can edit the whole chromosome. That is one advancement that's going to come. And RNA and protein editing is, go, is, is progressing very fast. In addition, virus induced gene editing is also uh, progressing very fast. And non-tissue culture method of gene editing is, is, is people are very interested in that. And in addition to the DNA at the nucleus, now you can edit the DNA in the chloroplast and the mitochondria, which is organelle gene editing. That is progressing very fast. And uh, global streamlined and harmonized regulatory process is a very key in getting the gene editor products to the market quickly. And more countries are adopting SDN1 and SDN2 in gene editing methods. And, uh, the, and mo most important thing is consumers. At the end of the day, if the consumers reject your product, doesn't matter how good it is. So consumers are the key at the end of the day. And uh, the, the perspective, consumer perspective, the lot of data out there, studies, consumer perspective is changing very positively towards gene editing. And the global market of gene editing is going to touch about $15 billion in 2030. And the global talent infrastructure development is happening at a very rapid pace, meaning it be, gene editing is getting democratized. And, uh, and uh, the science education and communication to public and consumers are, is, is also happening, is being addressed by many companies as a way to get the gene editing product to the market. And uh, there are many gene editing products that is coming out as we speak. But the first, very first gene editing product that was out in the market is gene edited soybean, which is which is which was edited to generate high oleic acid. This was generated by a company called Canix in the state of Minnesota. They used talents; they did not use CRISPR. And the second gene edited product that was officially approved, commercialized, and now out there in the market is from Japan, a company called Sanatex Seeds in Japan. They uh, developed what is called GABA tomato, gamma amino butyric acid enriched tomato via gene editing. And this is the second ever gene edited product that was approved by the uh, market uh, in Japan. So, and this is just two examples I'm telling. And there is a recently the gene edited banana for uh, uh, for uh, delayed ripening has been approved in Philippines from Tropic Biosciences. So there are a lot of gene edited products that are being approved or in the process of the approval as we speak. But uh, before I leave, uh, uh, one, the 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 argument I want to put and close is that. Uh, gene editing along with combination of all the other technologies, as I mentioned in the first slide, should be adopted in order to mitigate the climate change effect and also to take care of the increasing population and to develop crops and food with shrinking resources. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vasudevan. So is there any questions to ask? So, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, that's all for today, the virtual meetings.
so thank you very much to all the participants those who joined this webinar on fifth international conference on food science and technology during this period having different time zones so our most sincere thanks to all speakers students delegates and the media partners who have shown different destinations around the globe for the support and cooperation so let us thank speakers who have responded so well to our invitation to participate in this conference so we have received several papers which will form the basis of our discussion in various sessions so let us thank you all for associating with this conference by your presence now a special thanks to the program manager elena watson for his continuous efforts in putting all us together under one platform in this online event so once again i would like to thank all participants so hope we collaborate in future events in physical and virtual so that's all for today so e certificate and e handbook will be sent through email within 2 to 3 working days after completion of the conference so finally we extend our appreciation to each of you for your participation in this online conference thanks once again one and all thank you yes yes still anyone are there any queries anything you want to know so thanks once again have a nice day bye bye this is signing off akira